leadership is an ability to coordinate and to inspire. And the United States has been trying to coordinate and inspire for a long time. There are also nations and civilizations and cultures in the South, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, in the, in the, in the Sharq region, where all of us should create the new trend and the new future. We have to ask ourselves if the whole concept that we're talking about leadership and world order is the right one, because the way we were talking about it led us to where we are right now. Welcome to our Doha Debate Town Hall. I'm your host, Femi O.K. We are here today at Qatar National Library in partnership with Doha Forum to discuss the state of our global order, to ask who we should look to for leadership. On stage, young learners from campuses across Doha who will help guide our conversation. And we're also joined by three expert guests. John B. Alterman is a senior vice president and the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Sosun Chevli is an author and columnist, experienced foreign policy expert, and a German former politician. She's also an advocate for women's rights. Wada Hanfa is the president and co-founder of Al Shark Forum and the former director general of the Al Jazeera Network. I'm going to start with some context. In our lifetimes, Western countries have dominated the global order, but we are seeing a shift in the balance of power. New regional alliances and middle powers are on the rise. This new reality is epitomized by the intense worldwide reactions to the war in Gaza, where Western dominance over the narrative is being challenged. Conflicts are on the rise globally. Earlier this year, the United Nations said that there are more ongoing conflicts than at any point since World War II. And now, more than ever, it's crucial to think about who should lead. Middle powers or the global south? Maybe you think that the West still offers a more stable option. Or perhaps we should just rethink global leadership and focus on shared values rather than national interests. You will hear all of these viewpoints represented on stage today. But first, let's take a brief look at how we got here. For centuries, global power has ebbed and flowed among empires and nation states. If you were born in 1950, the backdrop to much of your life was the Cold War between the United States and the USSR, two superpowers vying for supremacy, militarily, economically, and culturally. This is known as bipolarity, two centers of global power, and it forces other nations to choose sides. During the Cold War, some nations didn't like the options on offer. They formed the Non-Aligned Movement, a group of nations that didn't want to side with either pole. But the nature and stakes of bipolarity proved too powerful to surmount. By the year 2000, the USSR's collapse had left just one superpower in its wake, the United States. So the United States is and remains the one indispensable nation. This is called unipolarity, when one nation has overwhelming power and influence. But that's not quite what's going on in 2023. Power is less concentrated. More countries and regions are claiming greater influence. Militarily, the US still dominates, controlling at least 670 military sites across the globe and spending more on the military than the next 10 nations combined. But in 2023, the Israel-Gaza war illustrated the limits of US power in the region as new alliances aligned with the Palestinians. Economically, there's an even more pronounced rise of so-called middle powers, states weaker than the superpowers that hold significant sway. Look at BRICS. As of 2024, this group, with echoes of the non-aligned movement, accounts for 46% of the global population and one-third of global GDP. Culturally, non-Western countries have a louder voice than a few decades ago. Think of the influence of K-pop, Bollywood, telenovelas or Dizzy. Some experts predict that the next major player won't even be a nation. 
Take Elon Musk and SpaceX, for example. He denied the Ukrainian military access to his satellites. That denied them the opportunity to launch an attack. That's a lot of power in one tech CEO's hands. And it's just one way that global tech corporations think Apple or Tencent could emerge as the biggest competitor on the global stage. With so many competing powers in an increasingly multipolar world, who should lead? Time to hear the starting positions from our speakers. John, you have said many times that there is no alternative to American leadership. Tell us more. The first thing is you have to think about what leadership is. Leadership is not command. Leadership is an ability to coordinate and to inspire. And the United States has been trying to coordinate and inspire for a long time. The reason is in part because of how we got here. In World War I, 20 million people died. 20 years later, World War II. 75 million people died. And then you found yourself after World War I and World War II, you had the legacies of colonialism still not unwound. You had two major nuclear powers facing off against each other. You had the prospect of even more global war. And so the United States created alliances with like-minded states to try to avoid the world getting into those kinds of problems again. If you think about the problems that we have now in the world, we look at climate change and issues, ad 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 issues of adaptation and mitigation and loss and damage. We have issues of disease that can spread around the world, as we saw with COVID, with remarkable speed. We have issues of trafficking and piracy and all these complicated things that require states to get together. And the United States tried to create and preserve a system to deal with these big problems that no single, gov no single government can deal with alone that every government is affected by. There are reasons why the United States has more power. It has legal alliances with other states. So there, it's easier to coordinate with like-minded states like the G7. Because the United States has power and technology like many other states in the global north, that empowers them to take action together. And there's also the fact the United States has been doing this for a while, so people have training and expertise to try to do this big, complicated coordination. Again, it's not directing, we're looking at COP28, it's not being directed by the United States, but that sort of international effort is supported by the United States and continues to be so. John, take, I, a, take a pause for a moment. The, the reason I'm asking you to take a pause is because Wada, when you were speaking, did a huge pause. He just went, and a sigh. <gasps> right? Yeah. So you've started your position. We'll hear more from you in a moment. But Wada, what is that sigh articulating? What is a different way of thinking about because a I, global order? I wish what John said was really, you know, true. Because definitely, the United States of America has led us to the current moment we are in. He is speaking about law, alliance for law. The United States of America has just voted yesterday in the Security Council against his fire in Gaza. And I don't understand if America at this moment in time is not but a country that is creating the chaos, including the climate change, by the way, which I do believe it is a result of a greed and a result of a philosophy of consumption and materialism that led us to the current reality that we are in. I would, you know, it's very important to articulate the following. The great values of humanity, equality and justice, where everyone agrees upon and owns internationally, were picked up by the philosophers of enlightenment 300 years ago, and they were the custodians of it. And every one of us was happy. But since these great ideas, liberal ideas, were hijacked by powers, especially the, the United States of America during the last five, six decades, and utilized as a weapon in order to create hegemony and dominance of the powerful over the weak, of the center over the margin, and create from us, the global south, the people who are not from the north, just a commodity in order to suck the wealth and to confiscate 
our diversity of culture and civilization, I think we have reached a moment where the humanity is sick and tired of that kind of culture. That culture has ruined what the humanity accepted as actually sacred values. This is why I, I, I advocate that the future should not definitely be led by the United States of America or by the Western powers. There are great people in the West who advocate these values, and they are sincerely stand for it. But there are also nations and civilizations and cultures in the South, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, in the, in the, in the Shark region, where all of us should create the new trend and the new future, not under the hegemony of a country that is advocating a genocide daily that is taking place in Gaza. Let me... So, Son, what is missing so far from these views of global leadership? First of all, salamu alaikum. Um, well, fact is that the world has changed. We see emerging powers self-confidently asking their place at the table and that are no longer willing to accept the dominance of the West, right? But we can also see, and you mentioned it, that the number of conflicts in the last years has increased. The number of people killed has massively increased even before Gaza. So we have to ask ourselves if the whole concept that we're talking about leadership and world order is the right one. Because the way we were talking about it led us to where we are right now. It is a world that is becoming, like for many people, not livable anymore. So this is where feminist foreign policy comes into play. Don't misunderstand the word feminist in this point. Feminist foreign policy is deeply anti-colonial. It questions the whole thing that the West dominates another another world or part of the world. But feminist foreign policy actually puts the individual rather than the nation state as the main reference point of security. It questions militarization. I don't know if you know, militarization has never been as high as it is today. And we know right now if militarization continues, a, a child born today is most likely to experience a nuclear war. So we don't want this world, right? We don't want our children to experience nuclear war, but they will if we continue to emphasize on nation state, nation security. We have to push for human security. And this is where, like, this is what feminist foreign policy wants us to promote. And this is the whole rethinking of the way we look at leadership and world global powers. Mm -hmm. I am going to see, speakers, how your thoughts resonated with our onstage audience. Yasmin, you were nodding your head. I am thinking at some point, one of the speakers, what they said, resonated with you. Listening to Mr. John at the beginning, I think the US playing as a unipolar um, power right now is very unfair to the rest of the world. They just think that the world is their playground, and we're all just these chess pieces. And it fully, like what Mr. Waddah fully resonated, what he said fully resonated with me because as a Palestinian, I feel like why is the US making decisions on my behalf? Why is the US killing, st not stopping the killing of my people even though the world agrees that it should stop? Well, I mean, I, so I'm sort of torn because on the one hand you say the US is too hegemonic and then you say the U.S. isn't using enough power to stop Israel from doing what Israel considers to be its self-defense. You know, we can talk about whether this is genocide. We can talk about whether it's a violation of international humanitarian law. I would argue it is the second and not the first, because during the Holocaust, the Germans killed 14 and a half thousand Jews every single day for three months. And 12 million civilians were killed during the Holocaust, and we're not nearly there, and nobody's trying to eliminate the Palestinians. International humanitarian law, war crimes, let's have that conversation. But if the problem is the United States is not being hegemonic the way you want them to be, my argument is the United States can't be hegemonic. The United States can't order the Israelis, or the Palestinians, or the Qataris, or the Saudis, or anybody else. Can you influence? 
Sure. Can you try to encourage? Can you try to encourage women to have a larger role in society? Can you try to, to preserve the liberal ideas that Wadak talked about? You can try to encourage. There are some things you can stop, but a lot of things leadership isn't about commanding. It's about inspiring. It's about bringing along. And that's, that's the constraint. There's no ability in the United States to push buttons and make other countries jump. But I believe, in a way, the U.S. is a self-proclaimed policeman of the world. And I would want to see a world where every region ha is its own pole. And I think we have a, good, a great start here in Qatar where this middle power is rising and, I would, uh, rising. and I would love to see us having our own pole and our own voice instead of looking to the West for any type of leadership in that sense. Let me go to the back row. Hello, my friend. Hello. Uh, John, you're right that uh, leadership is mean collaboration and influencing. But U.S. is not doing that. U.S. is just following their interests for their greed. For example, if I'm from Afghanistan, if I see they have supported and created a government, and we also supported uh, America. And in the minutes of night, in the minutes, they went to the terrorist group Taliban and uh, got agreement with uh, them. So how can you explain that, that we supported them, uh, we give them uh, the time to uh, help us, and when their interest lost, they went to the um, terrorist group and um, uh, made agreement with them without, cons uh, without consulting with us? Yes, go ahead. Um, I'd first like to thank our speakers. I think a lot of the points that I'll be bringing up are echoed by so much of what you said. Dr. John, I think we can all agree that the world requires effective leadership and one that's drawn to inspire everyone around us. But the question here is, is that the United States? And when we're specifically talking about the case of what's happening in Palestine right now, the fact that the US vetoed a decision to call for an immediate ceasefire is reflective of a lack of that leadership that's necessary. People in Gaza are dying, and they're dying by the days, and they're dying as we speak. Over 80% of the population in Gaza is currently displaced, and the U.S. has stood in front of the world and denied these people the right to a ceasefire. We've heard Israeli officials call on people in Gaza to go to Egypt in direct violation of those people's right to that land. So my question is, how is the United States, in this context of what's unfolding right now in Palestine, supposed to be considered and looked at by the world as an effective leader? So, so, so several things. You know, first, the number of issues are larger than just Palestine. I don't disagree with you as nearly as much as you think about the Palestine set of issues, okay? There is a belief universally almost held in Israel, widely held in the United States, that Israel is entitled to act in self-defense because Hamas went across the border killed 900 civilians, intentionally killed 900 civilians in cold blood, butchered more than 300 teenagers and, and, and young people at a concert, right? And that was considered a military operation. And there's a sense that can't be allowed. No country would allow that kind of butchery to happen to them. It's a question of, so what's, what's appropriate military action? And I think, as I say, very legitimate set of questions about international humanitarian law, what's permissible. The United States has been very outspoken, and it's very clear the United States has been talking to the Israelis from the beginning and say, there are limits to what you can do. The United States has been trying, and I think needs to try even harder. My friend David Satterfield is in charge of getting humanitarian assistance. I think cutting off water and food to people is absolutely barbaric and should not be allowed. Okay? We totally agree on those issues. Whether, from a political standpoint, are you better off stopping a war with Hamas with the possibility to return to power in Gaza? That's a political judgment that I think people can disagree about. But to my mind, the humanitarian suffering and any intention to use humanitarian suffering as a tool of war is impermissible, and the United States should not allow it, and the United States should act to stop it. Can I just ask you something? Don't you think that the credibility of the West is highly impacted by decisions made like yesterday? I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, this is as someone who's, I, I was born in Berlin, I'm a German Palestinian, and I know we speak a lot about values, our values as the Western world, but I do understand 
like when that the rest of the world, almost the majority of the rest of the world, like has some questions when we talk about values and rules-based order because the, our actions do not fit with what we preach all the time. I mean, no yes. country's actions always fit with where they preach. That's a, that's a reality, right? And then the global south is but divided. But no country in speaks the, about values as much as we do as West. Right, but, but, you know, and when you talk about the global south, India's taking a very interesting position on Palestine and Gaza. I think the, you know, the, the issue is going to be determined not by where we are today. I agree, today is horrible. Every time, look, my Instagram feed is also full of pictures of dead Palestinians, right? Because I think it's important that I see that when I'm talking about this, that I'm talking about reality. And I saw the 47-minute Israeli video of butchered Israelis, right? My heart bleeds every time I see those dead kids, young people, it's horrible. But the, the ultimately, where this is gonna come out is, so where's the political horizon for Palestinians? How do we get to a better place for Palestinians? And frankly, I cannot, for the life of me. John. See, can I please finish this sentence? I cannot, for the life of me, understand how we get there without serious, effective American leadership. Let's judge it by where this war ends, how this war ends. Can we have a horizon for people? Palestinian statehood? I think yes. yes Can we me, do that without the United States? I think no. John, John, let, me, John. Can, let me take some heat off your seat for a moment. Well done. No, but, Just, I, I'm going to bring in some yeah, more students okay. to, here so that they can use you as, as a resource. Yes, my friend, go ahead. So uh, my name is Mohammed al a student at Texas a &M University of Qatar. I would like first to thank all the speakers and a special thank you to all the audience. So Dr. John, I'm not here to actually challenge you in a bad way or something, but in the topic of multipolarity, you issued that we need to look for the U.S. as to being the world leader. The thing is, if the U.S. and we want the U.S. to be a world leader, how can we trust this superpower that, is, that can't actually handle the, the Israeli and Gaza conflict that is happening right now? I mean, the U.S. was agreed to the ceasefire between Qatar and Hamas and Israel in this deal. But then again, the U.S. vetoed the ceasefire thing at the U.N. So, how can we trust the U.S. to be the superpower of this world, and how can we trust everyone to just... Who would you trust? Um, I wouldn't want to spark a new conversation, but I would say everyone being a superpower and no one being a superpower. If No, this is counts. Yeah. I, I mean, look, I don't think, for, for the, the complexity of problems, I don't think it works. Does the U.S. need to lead, lead with humility? Absolutely. Does the U.S. need to share responsibility with a larger number of states? Absolutely, and I would say COP28 is a perfect example of a complicated problem. The U.S. isn't in the lead, right? But the fact that the United States is helping stitch things together, the fact the U.S. helped broker the deal between Hamas and the Israelis. Qatar played an important role. The director of the CIA was here to play an important role, right? We have al Air airbase here in Qatar to help defend Qatar. We have a whole bunch of maritime task forces to help protect maritime navigation and trade through both the Gulf and the Red Sea. It's not that the U.S. is trying to, to push everybody around. The U.S. is trying to bring people together to orchestrate, to coordinate, because John, nobody John, else is playing that role. John, I, I wish if America that you are talking about is the real America we see. Mm. I mean, really interesting. What you are saying is amazing. I would even vote for you to, the, to be the coming president of USA, you know? Really, I wish if America is there. I think I have other voters too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if America is there to create that kind of peaceful transition into I don't know what. Really? Is it American role? I mean, 30 years ago, you sponsored the establishment. This year, we're supposed to be celebrating the 25th anniversary of a Palestinian state based on the USA initiative of Oslo and so on. Where are we today? And you are saying without the US, US initiative of Oslo, a Palestinian the, state. Oslo, really? of course, was an American, right? The US tried to jump on to Oslo. The US did America, the Madrid America, we Oslo know. was Norwegian. Oh, John, you have been in the, you worked in the, in the, in the, the White House. You worked everywhere. I wasn't in the White House. In the State Only Department. Visiting. I mean, I know and you know that the Americans have double standards when it comes to the issues related to 
the Palestinian issue in particular, and many other issues that the Americans feel that they do not, does not fit into their parameters. You speak about international law. There is no country in the world that has disregarded international law like USA. From the war in Iraq in 2003 until today, just recently, the U USA voted against sending a request to the International Court of Justice, just a request from the National Assembly asking whether settlements in Palestine are legal or not. Your country said no to ask the International Court of Justice about a question like that. Your country is pushing countries not to send any court case to the International Criminal Court or to the International Criminal ICC. So on what basis there is something called international law that USA has a sponsor? In fact, USA has destroyed the essence of international law, of United Nations, on the concept even on trade, free trade, on globalization. You know, to what extent that system, which was created by after 1945, still exists? The only system that exists now is America, submarine nuclears, and also the American power that is ready to suppress and to even destroy whoever is going against it. All America right, so has only, lost that power. The only system that exists right now is America. Every student has their hand up. I'm going to keep those thoughts. Don't forget what you wanted to say as we move on to who is fit to run the world? Who could be the global leader? That is our umbrella discussion. But I want to talk about now, the rise of the rest, and start that discussion with a focus on China. Communist China is the greatest threat to American security and prosperity by far. China is set to account for around one third of global growth in 2023. As the second largest economy in the world and the largest trade partner of more than 140 countries in the world, China plays more and more significant role in the multipolar world. The new multipolar world needs a new system to support it. China initiated BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, and the AIIB and the other public goods to support the new multipolar world. As a leading country of uh, Global South and the important state member of the BRICS, which enlarged very quickly recently, China would like to share exper good experience with the rest of the world. I believe in the future, uh, the Global South countries, including China, can be the very important polar of the multipolar world. Some very different takes on China there. So we've got Nikki Haley, who is seeing China as a threat. And then you have Dr. Miao, who emphasizes China's vital role. What up? A threat to whom? China. A threat to the supremacy of the United States of America. But China has not been a threat to us, for example, or to the global south. Yes, we disagree with China on certain issues, like human rights or the Uyghur Muslims, for example, and others. But if it, you ask me, someone who have been in this region have covered a lot of wars. I have covered the war that the Americans did against Afghanistan, a war the Americans did against Iraq, a continuous war against Gaza, which they are part of it, and many other conflicts in the world. China did not really harm us in that way. So the challenge the Americans have is to the single dominance hegemonic state of the United States of America. And in my opinion, and again, I'm not defending China because I have a lot of problems with China as well. But I'm saying when we say it is a threat, a threat to whom? And at this stage, to, to be frank with you, I would love China to challenge the United States of America for one simple reason. Because as long as America is the only supreme power, then all of us are going to lose. Not because I would like China to replace it, but because I would love to see a new world order based on real diversity and respect of international law and a game that is not dominated or manipulated by one state. Susan. 
I mean, China is reality. A multipolar world is reality. As far as I know that in the American national security strategy, multipolar, not multipolar world is not like a phrase. It's not written in, your, in the documents, which is like ignoring reality. In the German national security strategy, for example, we very openly speak about multipolarity. We speak about the, the rising of middle powers, um, the global south. This is reality. There are countries who are fed up deciding between the poles, who just say, we have our own interests, and we're going to, like, depending on our interests, we're going to work either with China, or we work with the United States of America, or we work with Europe, like Kenya. There's different things with different actors. So the world of where one country has to decide on whom to deal with, this is over. But, it, but still, um, it's again a nation state focused approach. It's again, we're again talking about a world order that brought us to, to the world we're in. Again, we have to ask ourselves, why are we talking about China here and the United States there? Uh, and not focus on individuals, not focus on civil society. I mean, I may sound naive when I say that we have to question again and again the thinking of um, leadership, of world order. We have to see that peace is, such, is more sustainable when you include civil society. Peace last longer, peace agreements last longer if you have women on the table. It's not because women are the better people. It's because women make half of the world's population. And the more inclusive things are, the more inclusive peace agreements are, the better they are, the more sustainable they are. So let us just be open to rethink the whole concept of world leadership, of leaders. And, it, and we, when we talk about Gaza, the truth is, we all failed Gaza. We all failed, failed these people. We all are watching at the end of the day without having an answer how to stop this killing. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Femi. Um, my name is Minahil Mahmood. I'm a politics student at Georgetown. And going off of your point, uh, whether I cannot, for the life of me, understand why um, U.S. foreign policy insists on creating this reductive binary every 50 years of them versus another country. So for one half of the century, we had the USSR and then Russia pitted against them, and then the whole world, including Pakistan, where I'm from, having to choose sides. Once that was over and that got boring, now it's China. And I agree with you, like we aren't facing the same tangible, real threat to our lives from China the way we are to the U.S. Um, and I really cannot rationalize, and I would love if you could pitch in here, I cannot rationalize how this, the measure for choosing a hegemon that US foreign policy act, um, advocates um, push for is who is above accountability. Like, people in the US seem to me to be so threatened by the idea of China rising to the level of them because they in interpret this as China being above accountability mechanisms when that's not really the case. Accepting the fact that China has reached a certain level of social, economic, political superiority does not necessarily mean that they will forever be exempt um, of the crimes that they're committing to their, against their own people. This does not mean that we have to choose between China or the, or the US or Russia or any other country um, as the inhabitants of the rest of the earth. So I don't understand why this binary exists in every few decades of US foreign policy. Let me just bring in a few more thoughts and then I'll get you to wrap up. Yes, my friend, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Jeremiah Kassan from Texas A&M University. And I just want to recognize the points given by Mr. Wada and Ms. Halsan. Um, they've stated that where is the threat from China, but obviously as a Filipino, there might be personal bias into this. China is encroaching on the territories of not just the Philippines, but other Southeast Asian nations, um, violating the United Nations Convention on the Sea, and also with their Belt and Road Initiative, having predatory loans to multiple developing nations on, uh, across the world. Like, You've seen in Sri Lanka and many um, Western, uh, Eastern African nations. So we cannot rely or look at China as an alternative in the United, uh, to the United States for global leadership. 
I agree with what Ms. Alsana said that there should be a more individual or more collective approach to a new world order, looking at uh, individual stances on how politics and how economics should work. Because though communism or socialism may work for the People's Republic of China, this will not be the same case for all nations, and that a more collaborative approach would be appropriate in a new world order. Mm -hmm. Let me go to John first in yes, yes. a second. John, thanks for your patience. So thanks. So you took some of the things I was going to say, right? I mean, if you're, if you're nearby China, China looks a lot more threatening. You have an office in Malaysia. I don't know what, you, what happens when you talk to Malaysians about China. But Southeast Asia has a different attitude toward China, a different sense of China's intentions. Um, I don't think the U.S. Is, is trying to have a binary adversary relationship with China. They're often our number one trading partner, too. We just want China to be within the rules, to not try to undermine global order to advance some of these, some of these efforts it's making. So, Sen, I totally agree with you on the importance of engaging women, engaging civil society. The United States has been putting a lot of energy into that throughout the world. The fact that there's so many really talented women here on this stage right, is partly an, a consequence of things that the United States and like-minded countries have been trying to encourage throughout the world, not coerce, but encourage throughout the world. One of the real challenges when you talk about diversifying power around the world is civil society in the global south isn't as strong as civil society in Western countries. And Western countries have been working to spread the strength of civil society. So I totally agree with you, but I would argue that this is actually exactly the things you're talking about John, and the liberalism John, that Wadat was talking about is a consequence your of American leadership. Your co-speaker is about to argue back with you. So yes, feminist foreign policy is not only about bringing women into power or having like a more diverse platform. Feminist foreign policy is also about demilitarization and as far as I know the United I'm, I'm States is like having the, a lot of money put on militarization. Militarization has never been as high as it is today due to what the United States is doing. So it's not only about, yes, we want more women to have a voice, it's much more. But let me say a word on China again, which what is interesting is when we bring like the youth perspective to it. I read a survey um, that has recently been published about American youth. They look totally different to China. They're a pro they're, they favor a much more cooperative approach towards China, not the aggressive, they, they, as they perceive it, the aggressive stance on China, which is like, if you look at youth in general, they look different when it comes to Israel, they look, different, they look at it differently when it comes to China, they see multipolarity as a chance, and so it's up to you guys, when you leave this world, it's probably gonna be a better place. So the Americans have a great doctrine, which has been taking place for more than 100 years, called Monroe Doctrine, where the Western Hemisphere should not know, no power should threaten the American hegemony there. What the Americans are doing in South China Sea? Why, why China is not allowed to have its own Monroe Doctrine in a the, way or The Monroe another. Doctrine's from 19th century, nobody's mentioned. I mean, it's, nobody no, in the United States thinks now. that Can, the Western Hemisphere security when, matters. When the, Rush, when the Soviets sent few ships to Cuba, your president was about to have a nuclear war in, 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 in the 60s, isn't it? So the point is, why Russia and China are not allowed to have their, their sphere of influence. And when the NATO challenged you know, Russia by in, 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 you know, coming close to their borders, that crisis was created by the United States of America. And the current situation, America is in South China Sea, not to protect Philippines, not to protect Indonesia or Malaysia or any other Southeast country. They are there to limit the Chinese rise, and that's very public and clear. It's not because of human rights. It is not because of international justice. It is because the Americans do not want China to rise as a superpower that could challenge them. So, so one more thought that true. takes us away from China and America. Brazil, Russia, India, China as well, uh, South Africa plus five, BRICS nations plus five, how impactful could they be come January 2024? To, I still argue the following. We, the people of the South, 
And I mean the people of the South, I don't mean geographic South. I mean also the cultural South, including people in the United States of America and the West. We should never look up to one superpower or two superpowers to lead us. The, the new order should be value-centered, where humans are at the center of it, where international justice and international law applies on everyone, and then there is a real interest for everyone to sustain the system. But if we keep one power, China, Russia, or America, to be the dominant power, and they should define the values that the international order should operate based on, then we are going to face the same problem. I do not trust powers, but international powers. Mm -hmm. I do not trust China or Russia or America. Of course, I tested America now, and I know that it's not just a matter of, 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 of my hunch. It is actually the experience. We don't trust America because of what America has led the world to be. But also, if China tomorrow rises to be the sole dominant hegemon, then we are going also to have the same problem. So we need to fight for something else mm -hmm. where nations, nations have their own you know, civilization and culture manifested. Let me make a suggestion for what the something else could potentially be. So we go from hard power to soft power. So we're talking about something like the massive influence of Bollywood, Nollywood, Turkish TV dramas that reach 750 million people across 152 countries. That's almost a billion people watching Turkish TV. So I'm going to bring into our conversation one of our Doha Debates ambassadors. Hello, I'm Jay Montibes from the Philippines. I'm a K-pop fan and have experience with the fan culture that comes with it. This has highlighted to me the importance and power of community. These days, young people can be more than just consumers, but also critics and even trendsetters. In the past, we had to accept what older ruling elites deemed fit for society. And where I live in Asia, this usually came from the West. Now, with new technology allowing young people to connect and form communities globally and regionally, we're seeing emerging trends and even new societal norms. So, when it comes to new sources of soft power and cultural trends, can it disrupt hegemonic power structures as we have known them? And how do you think the power of young people to shape this has changed over time? Only one place I can start with this part of our conversation with our student audience in the middle row. Hello everyone, my name is Bayan Kayali. I'm a student at Georgetown here in Qatar, and I'm majoring in international politics. And I definitely think that the discussion of soft power is super important. We're seeing a shift in the dynamic of where soft power is centered and who carries soft power, and it's no longer simply concentrated in the West. Um, there's definitely a rise of soft power in non-Western states like Qatar, like South Korea, that continue to increase their soft power. But I think that the discussion on who is going to be the next global superpower, we can't base that discussion simply on soft power. That's not sufficient enough of an indicator. Because the reality is we never turned to the US as a global superpower because we were all watching Hollywood. And we're never going to turn to South Korea as a global superpower because we're all listening to K-pop and watching K-drama. So I think what's really important in the discussion here is the discussion of hard power. Who carries preeminence militarily, economically, diplomatically? And I think that statistics show that the two main competitors today, economically and militarily, and even diplomatically, are China and the United States. I have just recognized soft power in action. Go ahead, please applause. I start with the premise of soft power, you take it to hard power, I'm wrestling yes. it back to soft power, if I may. Middle row. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Iman Ismail, graduate of Georgetown University. Um, and I do agree with what Bayan has said about the importance of shifting the focus towards hard power. Um, but that being said, I think that soft power has a relevance in a different kind of way, is that there's a very significant attraction that soft power has for the youth. And if you're going to ultimately look at the youth as the future of the international and global politics, of the realm of international um, and global economics and, and, um, and the forming of cultures, you're finding that because 
because soft power is so attractive, you have swords of Nigerians who are moving to South Korea because they want to learn Korean. You have the same for um, quite a few Arabs who are moving to Japan to do the same. And I think that what that's doing is that it's introducing this shift in what is attractive and therefore a shift in what is desired as well. We no longer have the same political conversations, I believe, that might have been had before when we were not as globalized of a society as we are now. And I think of you know, myself as Sudanese, I was, raised in, um, I was raised in the Philippines and I am an American citizen, but I actively chose to be educated in the Middle East. That was, a, that was a, a decision that I felt was powered very greatly by the soft power of the region. So I wanted to be immersed in a culture that I felt I could relate to and in a place where I would not feel otherwise as I would in the US. Um, there was a shift in the mentality that I had and as well that I saw in many of my peers and my classmates where they chose that rather this was where they wanted to be educated and this was the culture and the community that they wanted to continue being in and therefore their political ideal ideals and ideologies have, ch have shifted. They may not necessarily be the same as American citizens but they belong very much to this region which is where what Ms. Sousan was saying about having your own form of representation in a way that's as inclusive as possible is incredibly significant because we no longer have generalized or you cannot say that we have generalized opinions. It's very, it's going to be very uh, affected by the culture and the influence that you have, which now is very cross-cultural, very multicultural and does not exist at all in a hegemonic way. We do not have the same attraction to American culture that may have previously exactly. existed and that's incredibly significant then to who has the hard power later on in the future. So Sam, one of the points that Jay, who is a Doha Debates Ambassador, brought up was about youth leadership and youth power. The fact that you're sitting here right now and your career tra trajectory is to do with youth movements. The fact that you had opportunities that brought you from a young person into a political sphere. What is the power of youth today? When I was still a student, I felt that it's very important for me as someone who comes from a family um, where my parents, they are not academics and they're illiterate and it's very difficult to make your way um, through the system in Germany. I felt that it's very important to have, to meet other people from different spheres, to meet other young people, to establish networks. And I started to found youth networks and be, participate in youth networks, youth leadership networks. Like I'm a Munich security young leader and I'm a young leader in different um, programs in Germany and in Europe. And that helped me actually to establish a network, to widen my horizon. And I kept doing this work. I love to work with young people but because it's so inspiring. It's so not cynical. When you're a politician, you're you're surrounded by so much cynicism. Like, because no one believes in utopia anymore. No one believes that individuals can make a difference. But youth, when you meet young people and you hear their stories, and all surveys show that young people look at the world in a different way. Like, as I mentioned, in the United States, young people have a totally different approach to the world than the government. When I look at young Europeans, they're not into transatlantic relations anymore. They look at different things what, that interest them, and social media has a cr plays a crucial role. So, for governments and politicians, it's so I would recommend that everyone actually works with young people, and everyone has young is surrounded by young people because this is the way that helps you change your mind it helps you to be inspired and helps you get out of like the circle of what we say like military power is the only thing that is relevant no it is not military power again has brought us to the chaotic situation that we are right now. That, that's where superpower comes into play. That's where, again, feminist foreign policy comes into play. And that's where you as young people, with your vision and your view and your aspirations, and you, you probably, you don't have the preju prejudice about different things that we as politicians would have. And, um, I only can say that the future of the world lies in your hands. When we're talking about soft power, we, we have to talk about news media. Uh, Wada, I want you to look at a clip. John, I want you to look at this clip as well. 
and then respond immediately off the bat. Why do you start, John, you go second. Let's take a look at the video. I want to talk a little bit about this term that I saw in your work, um, the Al Jazeera effect. Um, mm -hmm. What does that term mean? It, well, it's not my phrase, it's a phrase that's been used that came out uh, more popularly during the Arab Spring. It was an Al Jazeera moment, uh, like I think uh, it is here. But the phrase now has come to mean more than a one media organization in one country. And or the, even if it's in English and the footprint is expanded, it refers to other global media entities that are that are taking the, the initiative to report from what they know. Basically saying that what we're seeing now, the reportage about, the reporting about Gaza uh, in the West has been uh, to some extent so absurd that the veils have dropped. And I, for the first time, I think in my life, I've seen the, the hegemonic control of the West over media narratives becoming destabilized. The Al Jazeera effect all these years later, what is it now, Wada? Al Jazeera succeeded because it was the voice of the voiceless. Al Jazeera succeeded because it understood the concept of representing those people on the margin, not the centers of power. And it was not easy, it was not easy journey at all. The Americans bombed two of our offices, one in Kabul and the other one in Baghdad. And they banned Al Jazeera signal in the United States of America until actually Obama administration. So the idea is, this is another example, where people of the South could develop excellent alternatives be it soft power, be it intellectual uh, uh, sphere of, of thinking, and many other tools, if they are allowed to do so. But unfortunately, with the current structure of the world order, it seems to me that when you are trying to be faithful to your ideals, or to your civilization, or your culture, or specificities, eventually you are going to be fought against unless if you fit within the agenda of the Western powers. That's a problem. The issue is not because we are not capable of creating that diversity. Al Jazeera was not a challenge to the Americans. Al Jazeera was trying to show where the, what happening in our countries, because we understood it much better than others, the people who come to be just Orientalists in this region. But again, the suffering that Al Jazeera had in its relationship with international powers was a huge, not only the Americans, by the way, the British, the Australians, the Americans, the French, everyone at that moment in time was in alliance to suppress any view that might challenge the dominant media view that the West wanted the world to embrace. I started, I started writing about Al Jazeera in 1998. Your predecessor, Mohammed Jassim Al Ali, created a station which broke through the hegemony that Arab governments had over what their publics knew. The, the real profound revolution that Al Jazeera waged was it was no longer your government that could tell you what was happening in your country, in the region. It created a regional identity. And that's different. I think what Al Jazeera did, especially in the early days, it created this sense of, of dynamism and hybridity that I think very much goes to your experience, which I think very much resonates with the U.S. experience. If you think about it, right, pizza is an American, pizza is Italian, frankfurters are German, hamburgers are German. The United States is a place that has nationalized hybridity, that has made hybridity a sort of normal thing to be dynamic, to take in other ideas. I think the Arab world is very much more like that now than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, partly because of Al Jazeera. I think that's positive. That's not something that threatens the United States. In fact, that's something that resonates with the American experience, which is an experience both of dynamism, but I would also argue improvement. The United States has made profound mistakes in its history, profound mistakes and is getting better. And I think that self-criticism and dynamism are essential for global progress. And I think if we look at the Chinese response to COVID-19, I don't think you've seen that sort of dynamism, honesty, and improvement. Remembering that we're talking about news media 
as a soft power middle row. Welcome everyone. My name is Feiruz and I'm studying uh, journalism right now. Um, I would just like to point out that Al Jazeera, in my view and in many views, did not try to replicate, let's say, Western styles of journalism. I think what it's done or what's so revolutionary about Al Jazeera is that it has specific journalists from those specific regions that bring a different sense to journalism in general and how the reporting happens. So in Gaza, for example, we have journalists from the ground who are experiencing the genocide right now who are reporting. So they're basically people that are being affected. Their families are dying, children, and so on. So they are reporting the realities. On the other hand, if we go and see the CNN, they send a parachute journalist and put it there for a few months or maybe weeks, and then they represent the conflict, as they call it in Western media, in a very distorted manner. And we can see this even like how the Ukraine war, when Russia invaded Ukraine, how it was represented as they're like us, green-eyed, blue-eyed, Christian, white, but they're not like the Iraqi or like the Afghanistani refugees that are coming, so we need to help them. So there's always this like sense of supremacy that is really seen and tangible in news in the West that is not visible in Al Jazeera whenever it basically reports on any topic that is there. Like if it's reporting on Palestine, it's the same way that it's going to be reporting in another country, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on. There is this, I don't like to call it objectivity because I believe that that's something that cannot be achieved. We all have our biases and media companies have their biases, but it's very important to say that it's not that Al Jazeera is just bringing the news to you, it's also inspiring, which, I, which you mentioned that the US kind of tries to inspire and stitch societies, but I think in the way that we consume Al Jazeera or other like uh, global south uh, news, either on TV, social media, and we see these journalists experiencing these events, it inspires the, the youth, the people who are watching from their screens to move, to do something else instead of what's happening and keep the status quo. So again, Al Jazeera or any other global south uh, media is not trying to replicate the Western style. We have different styles, either in Latin America, in the Middle East, we have different styles that need to be also seen as not just replicas of the best, because I think that we can produce even better. So yeah, thanks. So I want to bring in Ian Bremmer here. He's president and founder of Eurasia Group, and he's giving his State of the World speech in Tokyo in 2022. If the digital space itself becomes the most important arena of great power competition, and if the power of governments continues to erode as it has in the last 10 years relative to the power of tech companies, then the digital order itself will become the new dominant global order. And if that happens, we're going to have to consider an entirely new set of actors the technology companies become the central actors in 21st century geopolitics. So, San, you have a book called Laut in German, or Laut, and it really looks at the power of technology, of our social media networks and companies. Could they be the vying power that isn't the US or China or middle countries that we need to be looking at for the future? Um, Absolutely. Uh, the, the power of tech companies cannot be underestimated. We know from a whistleblower, for example, Frances Hogan, she, she leaked documents of the, of the mechanism that Facebook works with in order to push emotions to the top, like how, how algorithm works in order to push disinformation to the top. Like, I wrote a book and we tried to talk to Facebook and co. And we know that um, there are certain networks that have the power to have an impact on democracies, like negative impact on democracies. We know for now that the Russian impact, for example, on US elections, um, polarizing society, um, supporting Trump messaging, it was something that is, was caused by social media and tech companies supported that. So they have huge power because also like young people, this is, this is one 
I mean, social media probably, I don't know, we were talking about Al Jazeera, but as far as I know, use consumption when it comes to social media is so much higher. And it influences their way of thinking, and we already can see it in reality. You think differently also because of TikTok, because, because of Meta, because of YouTube. So the power of tech companies is immensely, but what I would disagree with, there's a difference between independent Meta, Google, and Twitter, or X, and TikTok. He put it on a relevant, uh, on an equal basis, which is not. First, is in, they're independent. The others, at least, are vulnerable to Chinese influence, where that would, I would make a difference here. But at the end of the day, we have to realize that tech companies are already a global power. So, right at the back. I'm Sara Akbar. I'm a Pakistani Pashtun, and I'm a student here at uh, UDSD, the, uh, the University of Doha, and I'm, and I'm a cybersecurity student. So I think we all have to understand that the tech companies, it's not that how much control they have, but just by what they say, that the tech CEO says, no, that's billions of servers, networks, algorithms working in their favor. So that's, and the scary part is there's a lack of accountability, lack of laws, how can we restrict them? And there's also, I feel like countries and people, they don't understand how much control these companies have and it's the scary part is that they they are not they don't have to abide by a certain country's laws they their um, strength it goes through the borders across the borders in, in in different countries they can carry out different attacks they can stop cyber warfare they can start it without you knowing there are still countries that had no idea they were being attacked but they were attacked for for tens and twenties uh, 20 years, and I think here is where I think we should really, like if we're looking at a global superpower, I think what we, what we need to do is rein back some of the control from these tech companies and take some of these, these, uh, the, these companies and create some new laws for them and how we can safely um, go through this, this journey of a new world. I'm considering whether what I can actually do a response in 30 seconds. If you can, I'm going to go, what a, and then a student back here. What a, that's the, the challenge giant, you, go ahead. The giant tech companies are tools in the hands of the powers. Mm. They cannot go beyond certain limitations. Mm. They have a freedom within a sphere of influence that the powers would like them to have. But when they are trying to do something beyond the framework defined by international powers, they are going to be put under sanctions and they will be brought back to the center. So I do not really agree with what Ian Primer said in, in, in the clip. Hi everyone, my name is Alaq Qais Saad and I'm a recent graduate of Georgetown University. To me, I define power by owning the narrative and also disseminating it to mass audience. And that one thing that comes to mind is Al Jazeera, being able to adapt and change its media to reach different target audience like AJ+, which is uh, some like the only media that I generally consume on a day-to-day basis. And the way that I see it that we have experienced seeing American exceptional, exceptionalism up until the war on terror. And now that we have to look at other uh, leadership, but that does not mean that we will see a decline in US power. So now that we see the rise of the rest and one of the countries we could look at is Qatar, because of its size, it doesn't look like it's a threat to other countries, whether it be it Saudi or Iran, and this, ab and this ability to mediate uh, conflict. And also, uh, during it, uh, when it faced an adversary such as the blockade, it was tested whether or not it could pull off a move where they could stop gas towards the other Gulf countries, but they did not. And that's something Russia failed in that test with Ukraine. Once they did not like the answer, they threatened with cold winters. So we, will, we are going to see more share of power, but we will still see the US rule. I'm going to take us 
to the next part of our conversation. So everyone whose hand is up, I am going to try and make sure you all get part in part of this conversation. So bear with me, stand by, because this is the part of the show that we call The Majlis. It's a space for understanding multiple perspectives. So I just want to take a moment to reflect on what we have all been discussing. Have you heard something that you haven't considered before? Has your perspective changed? Let's see how we can actually get through this. I'm going to give you 20 seconds for a change of perspective. <laughs> It's going to be a fast change of perspective. Starting on the back, the back row. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Marielle and I'm a student of global affairs. I think the only change in perspective that I had is that the US foreign policy or the, effect, the influence that they have on the world It kind of fell into their lap. It wasn't something that they sort of like were looking for. Uh, with the decline or uh, when the USR, USSR collapsed, they were the only one country that decided to become exceptional. That doesn't mean that they made the best decisions right after that. You know, instead of arming themselves, you know, they should have used this power to kind of stop uh, proliferation or many of their global warming. There's many other issues that they haven't proven Uh, in the world of today, especially with what's happening in Gaza, that they've uh, been able to be this omnipotent power, making the absolute best decision for everyone else. Change of perspective, something you hadn't considered before, Midoro. I think, some, I think something that um, I was a very idealist before this discussion and believed that multipolarity was the way to go, but rather after this discussion, I think that. Uh, bipolarity is the most realistic and best option to, to reach for as um, when we see the diminishing gap between two main superpowers such as China and the US, the diminishing gap creates this competition between these two states to please the, as Wada said, the voice of the voiceless and um, kind of represent multiple perspectives and multiple regions. Middle row, hello. So my name is Mohamed Bakri, I'm an engineering student at Texas A&M. And one thing that's shifted from my perspective uh, going into this town hall uh, was that I believe that it was a discussion of whether multipolarity, bipolarity, or unipolarity was the best approach for world leadership. But I fundamentally believe now that the discussion has, we've seen people uh, shift blame from the US to Norway, from US to China, or other way uh, in conflicts. And I think that fundamentally, I believe that competition is not good for world leadership. I mean, in economics, the general consensus is that competition is good for consumers because it reduces prices. But I think in the power, in the fight for global leadership, this is not true. And all competition leads to is proxy conflicts uh, between uh, global superpowers. And we have to look for a different uh, world leader, whether that be an international organization um, with maybe a one country, one vote policy or something different. It can't be global superpowers or individuals or tech companies. From this town hall, the one thing that has shifted my perspective on is that multipolarity doesn't mean that there must be equal distribution of power among nations, but rather to have some nations powerful in certain aspects, as you have seen with the United States having dominance over military, China over economics, with middle powers like Korea, Qatar, with power over perspective and the media and culture, which is so important to provide perspective and at the same time representation around the world. So that has changed my perspective here. And yeah, that's all. In 70 minutes, that's impressive. Hello, my friend. Okay, so um, I believe that what changed my perspective in this town hall, I think that now soft powers are like a major power around the world. And I think that Qatar has done an amazing job with the soft power and shifting, whether shifting the narratives or issuing specific statements. I'm now realizing that soft powers might be now stronger than the harsh powers with like absolute dominance. And you didn't have that thought before you came in, to, in today? Well, I had it to an extent, but now I think soft powers are like- You're completely convinced. Them. Yeah. All right. My point is quite similar in, in this sense, because I've always seen hard power as the way to go, especially with the multipolar, in the multipolar world who will be economically dominant or militarily dominant. But the thing is that soft power has really something that, uh, because soft power creates this ideational hegemony. And if we really want to move to a, multi, a multipolar world, we have to break down these ideational hegemonies that the West has created um, through all the historical process of colonization and so on up to this day. 
I'm going to let our guest speakers know they have one minute each for your final thought. I will get you to formulate that final thought while I just get some more perspectives from our studio uh, audience right here on stage. Yes, right at the back. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. This is Hiba. I am a digital humanities student at HBKU. And to be honest, like the question of what what changed, actually, my thoughts crystallized. Like it was in front, right in front of my face. I'm studying digital humanities. I co-founded a digital platform, social media platform from the global south. But coming to this discussion, I was thinking that oh, is it the government? Oh, is it the power of the people? I wasn't able to find, to figure out the middle way. And actually, technology is the middle way between people and governments. No matter how much power it try to control, like for example now, obviously Meta is so much pro-Israel, but it's still not able to shut down the Palestinian voices because there are thousands and thousands of content creators. So I think technology, like in my mind now, it's crystallized that technology is the way. Your final thought. Um, you know, I so I think what we heard here was actually really interesting from the students. That was, to me, the most surprising and most satisfying. There's this problem with competition. Should the United States be forced to be honest and kept honest and called to account? Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. I think everything the United States does should be subject to justified criticism and revision. At the same time, pure competition is destructive, leads to proxy wars. And so that's, I think, to me, the tension, and it's the students who highlighted it for me. You want, yeah, competition can be good because it keeps you sharp, but competition leads you to all sorts of negative behaviors too. And it seems to me that the challenge is how to balance that, how to get that balance right. There's not one answer. The United States left to itself, the United States hates monopolies. Some of the tech companies are monopolies. Monopolies are a problem. It doesn't keep people honest. But the competition can be destructive too. And we have to f all together find a space that puts us in the right space between those two extremes. We got together today to ask who should we look to for leadership? So, Sam. I again want to iterate me, that I feel that we have to rethink the whole concept of dealing with global powers and leadership. I know that feminist foreign policy might raise negative associations because the word feminism could sound like another Western doctrine that the Western world want to implement in the global south. But as I said, it's not. It's deeply anti-colonial. It's it's so much, it so much questions the whole concept of the West dominating the rest of the world. I mean, you're young people, right? You have to think of ways that probably are not that realistic at the end of the day. Don't only believe in the things that you read about international relations, like unipolarity, bipolarity, multipolarity. All of these concepts have led us to the world we're stuck in right now like the US being the superpower, China being the second superpower, Russia there, still, it's so patriarchic. It's still man actually dominating the whole world. Men that are also pushing more for militarization of this world. So if you go home, question the whole thinking of, is that right that we still talk about leaders and the way we are talking about leaders right now? The, be ready to be loud on things. And even if it sounds like Ethiopia, if it sounds naive in the first run, I was not a feminist years before because to me, feminism was a white thing, right? Because my parent, my mother wears a headscarf, my sisters wear a headscarf. I come from a religious family. Feminism to me was anti-Muslim. But then I learned that intersectional feminism could, is something that I can refer to as a Muslim, as a practicing Muslim, because it's anti-racist. It's where I feel I have a position. And so if you look at feminist foreign policy, it's not only we want to have women being the next leaders, because women are not the better people. We're not better human beings. But if we have half of the world population on stage 
on the table, the result is going to be a better one because it's more inclusive. So, and we need men in order to adopt feminist foreign policy. So if you go home, read about feminist foreign policy, try to, maybe it's not the right thing for you. Maybe it's not, you feel like, oh, not the way Sausan was talking about it, because it's also open. It's something that every country can adapt to in his or her own way. So don't stick to the concepts that you heard about and you read about. Try to think in utopia and make, like, step by step, make utopia reality. That's, I guess, the only way we can prevent this world from falling apart even more than it is already. Wada, who should we look to for global leadership? Have you changed your mind? I do believe in the following. A, this moment that we are going through is historically charged, crowded with a lot of energy and emotions and feelings and geopolitical transformation. This is a historical moment that we really would like to live and to think about and to strategize how to use. Second, I do believe in the power of the people. I do not trust centers of power to shape our future and their tools. I do believe that people today are smarter, much more clever, much more strategic than generations before us. And therefore, we would like to harness this energy created at this moment in forging international alliances, international movements, not necessarily amongst state actors, mm -hmm. but also amongst those who are advocating values that everyone agrees upon. Yes. I think today we have, we have allies in Africa, in Asia, in America, in Europe, and in Latin America. We have allies everywhere who believe like us, believe like you guys, who are, I am very pleased to listen to their thoughts and ideas. We don't want to wait and see the next hegemon, whether United States or China or Russia or whoever, mm. to design our future. Yes. Today, not the ages where states only could shape the future. In fact, we need to take that into our hands. Once we do that, then we can, after that, find out which powers that could serve that agenda. Because at this moment in time, in my opinion, no one should be entrusted. You cannot trust politicians on your future. You cannot trust centers of power on your future. You cannot trust centers of economy on your future because each one of them is following his own interest, maximizing interest, rather than trying to create something excellent for all of us. Therefore, yes, I call upon the youth in particular to take that seriously, to start networking amongst groups across the world, to stand for great values of justice and equality and freedom, and to break the barriers that unfortunately centers of power has created uh, amongst us. And before that, and this is the most important thing, we need, we need to get rid of the psychological, intellectual programming mm. that the Western civilization has put us through and convinced us that we cannot depart from. We have a great heritage, great civilizations, great values. If we really enrich it with contemporary understanding of reality, we will come up with something unique, different, and centered around humans rather than powers. Thank you very much. That's feminist foreign policy. We agree? That's feminist okay. foreign policy. John, you join us? We agree, all of us? That's yes. feminist foreign yeah, policy, and, and, actually. And the only problem said. is that that means liberal <laughs> values affecting politics, which is something the United States has been trying to do oh, oh, yeah. around the world for decades. And at this point, <laughs> as more debate breaks out, we have come to the end of our discussion. Thank you to John B. Altman, Sosan Chevli, Wada Hampa. Thanks to our on-stage audience you. for your excellent insights. Thank you.
Thanks to Qatar Foundation, our host, Qatar National Library, and to our partner, Doha Forum. Special thank you to Qatar Debates. And let's continue the conversation online. And we're at Doha Debates on all of our social media platforms. And also look out for our brand new podcast, Necessary Tomorrows. It's a six-part series that imagines our future and combines science fiction and fact. And it premieres on January the 8th. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Now, I was always told that in a library you had to be very quiet, we had to be shushed, but when I say thank you one final time, we should meet the people reading in the Qatar National Library, wonder what is going on in this auditorium. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>